there are multiple religions and tons of different miracle claims in the world today. So how can Christians hope to use miracles as evidence for their particular faith? And it's argued that if an all-powerful and all-loving God exists, we would expect that he would have provided us with better miraculous evidence than what we currently have. Such ambiguity, we're told, is not what we would expect. So what kind of miraculous evidence could end all of this religious confusion? A skeptic who goes by the name of counter-apologist has come up with the following fix for God. Often, apologists will cite how God doesn't use obvious miracles because he doesn't want to force non-believers into a relationship with himself, even though such miracles occurred in biblical times and places. Were those people forced into a relationship or belief in God? If not, then such reasoning wouldn't apply here. If God loves all people equally as a maximally loving being, then why do people in the Bible get such preferential epistemic treatment? In fact, what justification is there for ceasing all verifiable miracles not long after Jesus' ascension? This point cannot be understated, because the key aspect here is that the imposition of methodological naturalism is a direct consequence of the way the world is right now. If a god exists, then god wants this ambiguity about religion to persist. Consider this thought experiment of a world where methodological naturalism would not be held when it came to historical evaluation. Imagine our world as it is now, except at every Mass in every Catholic Church. When the priest goes to do communion, he pours water into a clear glass and after saying a prayer, the water turns into wine before the entire congregation. Imagine that this could be studied under controlled conditions. Scientists could verify the water pre-prayer. They could inspect the priests. They could control their garments. They could inspect the wine afterwards. The wine could even be the same type and molecular composition every time, regardless of the type of water put into the cup ahead of time. Far from being mundane, this would be the highlight of every service, especially since no other religions could replicate this kind of empirically verifiable, physically impossible miracle. One wonders if there would even be other religions if this world was real. In such a world, with this kind of background knowledge informing our beliefs, we would be able to interpret historical Christian miracle claims in a way not available to miracle claims made by competing, contradictory religions. We would have a solid basis for concluding that the Christian miracle claims were true and reason to doubt the others is false. We wouldn't even have other denominations of Christianity if only Catholic priests could do this miracle. Imagine how many more people would be Christians in this hypothetical world. Some apologists try to say that even in light of such evidence, many would not convert, instead believing like the demons do. In fact, to avoid issues with this argument from divine hiddenness, they might say that none who do not believe already would become Christians in light of this new evidence, but this doesn't pass the smell test. Ask yourself if you would believe in this scenario. If you already believe now, would your faith be stronger or weaker? I for one know with certainty that if such evidence were available, I would convert. So what can we say in response to this? Well, in the first place, I disagree with the assertion that the evidence for the chief Christian miracle is all that unclear. In comparison to other miracle claims made by other religions, the resurrection of Jesus starkly stands out when rightly examined. Many, if not all, miracles claimed by other religions can't be verified historically, and there are historical criteria that we can use to weed out unpromising miracle claims, and I'll talk about that criteria in a future video. Furthermore, I believe historical evidence is sufficient for accepting a miracle claim, although we would expect that kind of evidence to be stronger than just mundane historical claims. Claims, that evidence doesn't need to be completely overwhelming. We accept many things based on historical evidence. I suppose we could imagine a world full of miracles. We could also imagine a world in which nurses earn $10 million per year. I think most people would say, however, that nurses earn a sufficient salary. There is also sufficient evidence to trust in the main Christian miracle claim, even if we could conceive of more evidence. Simply put, if the facts can be accounted for without difficulty on the supposition of a miracle, but not without greater implausibility on the assumption that a miracle didn't occur, that is significant evidence in favor of a miracle. And I'm also not sure that there's anything wrong with the idea that we would expect to see more miracles than others at certain times of redemption history. It doesn't seem necessary for God to provide the exact same evidence at all times for every person. Occasionally, as in the case of Jesus, God endorses a person with many miracles at critical points in history. I think C.S. Lewis is on the nose when he says, God does not shake miracles into nature at random as if from a pepper caster. They come on great occasions. They are found at the great gangly of history, not political or social history, but of that spiritual history which cannot be fully known by men. How likely is it that you or I will be present when a peace treaty is signed, or when a great scientific discovery is made, that we should see a miracle is even less likely. Nor if we understand, shall we be anxious to do so. Nothing almost sees miracles but misery. Miracles and martyrdoms tend to bunch about these same areas of history. Now, one might also worry that counter-apologist is not treating God as a personal cause. God, if he exists, would be a personal being. He'd make decisions as a person does. He's not trying to act like a law of nature. In the grand scheme of things, God would decide when to do miracles based on his knowledge, human reactions, and what would benefit 
everybody. Remember that Jesus reportedly performed many miracles other than just rising from the dead. In the Gospels, Jesus is said to have multiplied the loaves and fishes because the crowd was growing faint with hunger. It seems that the miracle in that case is more of a response to human suffering than an attempt to necessarily guarantee a certain theological doctrine. Occasionally, God may perform a miracle out of compassion, in response to private prayer, to get somebody to repent, or for unknown reasons. But the real question is whether counter-apologist scenario would be the source of mass conversion to Catholicism, and I think that prospect is quite unlikely. I can already hear the complaints. People would say that it's wrong that God allows only men to perform this miracle. And why is it only that celibate men get to perform this miracle? And isn't this water into wine thing every Sunday a bit trivial? Why does this seemingly insignificant miracle, although repeated, give the Catholic Church the right to say that one can't use birth control or have an abortion, marry somebody of their own gender, or restrict their sexual life to just heterosexual marriage? And if God can turn water into wine so easily, why doesn't he heal, say, my mother's cancer or miraculously cancel my past due bills? It's also not difficult to imagine people becoming angry with God when he makes such a seemingly insignificant miracle, this repeated thing, in the face of great human suffering. Suffering. The question could also be asked, if God can repeat this miracle, why doesn't he just put an end to human suffering right now? He could effortlessly clear every hospital and multiply enough food to feed every hungry person. This water into wine scenario might resolve counter-apologist doubts about the problem of evil and other questions that he has about theism, but I think that this would accentuate the problem of evil for many others. Because of this, I think many atheists would just assume that the miracle must have some kind of natural explanation, and science would necessarily reveal it someday. Saying otherwise would just be a God of the gaps argument. Because in the face of the great suffering in the world, surely the all-powerful and all-loving Catholic God just can't exist. It's also very possible to imagine some Protestants and Orthodox Christians rejecting Catholicism because of long-held doctrinal differences and attributing such miracles to deception or even the devil. For all of these reasons, I think it's easy to see people becoming contemptuous of Catholic priests and maybe even wanting to persecute them. So I don't think that counter-apologist imaginative scenario is really all that successful. Now I grant that this does open a can of worms. Why a miracle is granted in one instance but not another is not an easy question to answer. This should come as no surprise since it is an aspect of the problem of evil. Not to minimize the difficulty, but it can just as easily be asked why certain other goods such as intelligence or beauty aren't more evenly distributed throughout creation. I think we could all agree that if God does heal the sick today, then that would reduce the amount of suffering that is in the world. So miracles can be good, but they aren't always the highest good from a theistic perspective. The ultimate good is having a proper relationship with God. Sometimes receiving lesser goods can distract one from pursuing or receiving the highest good. So in one instance, as I already mentioned, Jesus provides food for a crowd of people who were so committed to hearing his message that they were prepared to go hungry to the point that they were going to faint. But when faced with hungry people who simply want free food, Jesus resisted performing another miracle. In the Christian faith tradition, miracles often involve divine and human cooperation. It's possible that God is willing to perform more miracles, but there are people who are just too afraid or unwilling to cooperate. For example, Ananias is told to pray for Saul to receive his sight. Well, Saul had a reputation for killing Christians. To believe that that he truly heard from God must have been a really strong act of faith. It also makes sense that miracles are less common in climates of disbelief. The Gospel of Mark says that in the area where Jesus grew up, many people refused to take him seriously, which is why he could do no mighty work there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. These are suggestions that are not meant to be comprehensive, but to just undercut at least a few of the issues raised between miracles and evil. Counter-apologists claim that if miracles were performed repeatedly in a controlled environment, mass revival would be the result, but that seems to be unfounded. Essentially, he sets an unnecessary high and flawed standard of proof. In addition, it ironically seems too low given the possibility that mass conversion might not necessarily follow. To verify genuine miracle claims or to distinguish them from counterfeit ones, we don't need to apply such a flawed standard of evidence. In my next video, I'll discuss how to filter out miracle claims that are more poorly attested by just using normal, common sense historical criteria.